it was terrible firing. It was a lot of awful lot of casualties. We had losing guys left and right, and uh, they would bring up uh, replacements on two and a half truck, trucks. They'd come as far as they could come, and then they'd unload these replacements, and then they'd, and they would come in. The trouble was they they'd go into the same foxholes that the other guys had left, and the Germans had that had that place all figured out. <laughs> they knew where everything was. These poor guys, some of them get in there, they weren't in there a half hour and they were dead. You know, they just pff, fire in there again. Welcome to Triumphant Spirit, America's World War II Generation Speaks. This program is a series of broadcasts featuring the stories of a generation that fought and won the Second World War. No matter how they fought the war or where, on the home front or the battlefield, each veteran featured on the program contributed valiantly to a victory that changed the 20th century. Here are their stories in their own words. They are stories of actions and deeds that not only help shape the outcome of the war, but the very world we live in today. Vince, after D-Day, what happened to you and your unit? Well, at that time, we, we moved inland finally. By the next night, we, we parked alongside the, this road. What the heck do they call it? A, a draw, you know, with an uh, exit off the beach. A road off the beach, right. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, so uh, we didn't move off till the next day. And uh, right not far across the road from us was this big uh, black house. And there was a German 88 in there, which had done a lot of firing during the day and, and pinned down a lot of things and hit an awful lot of stuff on the beach. And also, um, as part of that, they, uh, it was a, they had mortars, they had shelves alongside, it was all concrete. And in the corner of the thing, they had a, a mortar that they could plunk down, and it was all painted in murals uh, that uh, I guess somebody would give them the coordinates and they could plunk that mortar, the, the crew could plunk that mortar and hit any part of the beach without even seeing what they were firing at, you know? And they had these shelves all, all with these uh, mortars. And uh, on the other side of the road <coughs> was uh, uh, machine gun emplacements and uh, trenches. And they ran along the bluff and, uh, and they'd have machine gun every so often. And they'd, they would fire constantly, you know. And uh, but at any rate, we 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 stayed there for about half a day, I guess. I guess. And uh, oh, one of the fellows had to go to the bathroom. They <laughs> Kralva, isn't it? I remember. <laughs> and he had to go. And uh, so he says, "Oh, go ahead." So uh, and uh, in the left, there were there were. Uh, quarters, I guess, underneath, you know, for, for German troops. And uh, it was like uh, a Pennsylvania mine thing, shaft, you know. So he went down in there and uh, didn't bring his rifle with him. And that was a no-no. You know, you, you, you carry your weapon wherever you go. And uh, 
But anyway, he had to go. And a few minutes later, he comes back, you know. And he, say, he says, there's a German down there. And the guy says, I crashed your rifle. So he went down. A few minutes later, he comes back with this little guy. looked like a, a Polish, young Polish fella. And he's, and he shoots and he shoots. And, you know, and uh, Nick, Nick, Choy, Nick, Choy, Nick Paulson, Nick Paulson. They had a lot of uh, Russian and Czechs and so forth in their troops there, I understand. And uh, so they took, took him and said, well, bring him to the MPs. The MPs had a, uh, a place down on the beach where they herded all the prisoners. And, uh, and you know something? I would talk about medals. Um, oh, may have been a few weeks later, this fellow got the Silver Star. <laughs> we laughed about That was the first medal we knew people got, you know. And he got the Silver Star because I guess they had him, you know, bolstered the morale, get some medals out or something like that. So he got the Silver Star for nothing. We rode him to death from that day on. Vince, you mentioned Sorry. your experiences before St. Lowe. Hmm. Could you elaborate on those experiences? Well, what we did was we were just uh, really uh, supporting the 9th Tactical Air Force. They were uh, P-47s, and they, they uh, would follow the infantry and uh, pushing the Germans all the way. And they would go on their, uh, what the heck they call those, sorties, and uh, they would strafe and they would bomb. They had these 500-pound uh, bombs, I guess they were on their, on their wings, and they would use those, and they would do a lot of strafing. And they'd come back. They were going back and forth all the time, following the, following the infantry. And um, that was our job. And we saw very few airplanes, very few German airplanes. And, uh, well, you know the story about those. They didn't have the gasoline or something. They, they weren't up in the air so much. And uh, so that was easy for us. But... Uh, we were called on maybe to uh, set up a roadblock or something like that. You know, that's about all. And uh, very seldom did they dig in the guns. The guns were, we were not around the guns. They were off someplace. And uh, because they're moving, they, they couldn't very well dig in and move those, those 40s. They had uh, these big outriggers. You know, they fanned out and they had the gun in the middle. <clears throat> and the fellows would be ready to fire on any aircraft, and I say very few. But uh, that, that was our job, just following along with the infantry. And, uh, oh, one thing, about the second night, we were dug in along this, uh, the hedgerows as individuals. Again, Ferky and I dug in together. And just around dark, all of a sudden, bang, more and more noise, you know, not that we, we weren't used to too much then. And... Uh, all of a sudden, everybody's firing up into... I, I was one of them, too. I could see Germans up in the trees, and I'm firing. <laughs> everybody's firing. And then all of a sudden, after just a couple of minutes, all, there was all... Uh, cease firing, cease firing. And a lot of swearing and cursing and so forth. And uh, so uh, we stopped, and the officers were discussing things very gently. <laughs> they were hollering like hell at one another. It was a second division head come in. That the, the guys with the, had a big uh, Indian head patch. They had landed and they had come in and they were brand new. And uh, they thought we were Germans evidently. So they're firing. Nobody was hitting anybody incidentally. I know I was firing. I could swear I could see guys up in the trees. There wasn't anybody there. <laughs> Nobody else saw anything either. But boy, we fired. And uh, we told, he told us to stop. And then uh, we, we got a laugh out of that after a bit. But then we continued on with them. And, and to make it short, we got up to uh, St. Lowe, uh, just near the end of July. And then the 28th, a lot of divisions were, were in then, you know. And 28th was coming in. And uh, we were then switched to the 28th Division. And we stayed with them until the end of the war. But uh, uh, from St. Lowe was a different story than, you know, when we, we broke out of there. You were with the 28th Division when it was involved in the Hartford Hertgen Forest Battle mm -hmm. south of Aachen, Germany. Yep. Vince, can you describe your experiences in the Hertgen Forest? Uh, 
Well, the Hurricane Forest was uh, a place that it seemed to rain all the time, not just rain, and it poured rain. And there were mud up to your armpits. Yeah, it seemed that way half the time. And uh, the infantry, I, I was with the, we were with the 112th Regimental Combat Team. And any assignment from them, and largely uh, ground assignments, not, not the aircraft, you know. But at uh, any rate, uh, there were three towns that they were primarily concerned with, Schmidt, Kamenschaut, and Wozniak. And uh, Hurricane Forest, the, there, were, it was, uh, there was a series of dams there that held back the Ruhr River. And uh, another, the, the Call River ran through there, the K-A-L-L River. And there was a bridge across, they had to get across that bridge. And uh, I can remember, it was awful high. You looked down, it, and there's, there was the water. And then dams are up this end. And uh, the infantry would get an assignment. They'd kick, kick off maybe at maybe 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock in the morning. <clears throat> and they had to get these three towns. Well, they'd get them maybe before noon, two of them. And the third one in the afternoon. They'd get the three towns, and the Germans would come kick them out. You know, that was, it was, it was terrible firing. There was a lot of, awful lot of casualties. We had losing guys left and right. And uh, they would bring up uh, replacements on two and a half truck, trucks. They'd come as far as they could come, and then they'd unload these replacements, and then they'd, and they would come in. The trouble was they'd, they'd go into the same foxholes that the other guys had left, and the Germans had that, had that place all figured out. Well, they, they knew where everything was. These poor guys, some of them get in there, they weren't in there a half hour, and they were dead. You know, they just fire in them again. And uh, that went on. We were there for about three weeks, and that was, that, that was what it was, just, just a slaughter. And uh, these new guys coming in, and like I say, they, they didn't even, even know their friend next to them. It wasn't a friend in them, but they didn't know them. They didn't get their names even. They were casualties already. You know? And uh, like I say, it was a terrible place of uh, awful lot of mud. Vehicles couldn't move. Tanks couldn't move. And then they'd bog right down. Was, and uh, a lot of swearing, cursing, noise, and so forth, and trying to, trying to dig out the vehicles and to get them to move somewhat. And uh, so uh, the Germans were like uh, shooting fish in a barrel. And uh, they were doing it too. They were losing men too. But, but I don't think as many as we were. That's why we, we lost an awful lot. That's why we wound up at uh, the Ardennes, because we, didn't, we were losing men. Uh, all divisions, there was a, I think uh, the 8th Division was in there. The 78th finally came in. But one division would come in, the Germans would knock them off, and they'd bring up another one, you know. And uh, like batting a head against the wall. But then we wound up down the Ardennes. That's, that's, to me, that's Hurricane Forest, terrible place. Terrible place. But Vince, when we mention forest, many <coughs> people have an, an idea of mm -hmm. uh, a forest like we have here within Monmouth County, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. However, can you close your eyes for a minute and possibly describe mm -hmm. what the Hurtgen Forest mm -hmm. looked like to you when you were there? Mm -hmm. Well, it was these great big uh, evergreen trees, fir trees, uh, all thick, thick with uh, those trees. And then there were the, the roads would run through them, a road. And there weren't real good roads. They were just paths, really, uh, dirt paths. And that's why it was a good place for vehicles. They couldn't move, you know. And there was the constant rain. And then after a while, snow. And it, it was cold, wet, rainy. And uh, I'll just say not a pleasant place. <laughs> What happened to the 28th after the bloody battle of Hurricane Forest? Well, we had to, they had to refit the division. They had to get the replacements in. Lost well, so many of them. And it was supposed to be a quiet place. And uh, what happened there 
we had uh, replacements would come in, and uh, that we were right. Let me let me say this. We personally, our outfit was just across the Ur River, O U R, which is a border between Germany, Luxembourg, and uh, Belgium. Our artillery was back there. They would be firing across and uh, supporting these new replacements who would be attacking pillboxes and so forth. There were no Germans in them. They were out, and, uh, but that was a training. And they would, had an actual training exercise. They'd fire and fire and they'd attack these things. And uh, that was you know, how they learned. And uh, our, our, uh, our, self, our guns were uh, in the, up in the hills alongside the river. The river was maybe, maybe a quarter of a mile down there. And it was high ground and the river was down. And uh, uh, the river ran corkscrew fashion. And we were across some town, and they still don't know the name of the town. I think it was Uren, O-U-R-E-N, I think. I'm not sure. But it was a, a bridge, fairly wide, but it was a, a stone bridge. And uh, um, yeah, a tank could go across it, or vehicles, heavy vehicles. And uh, so... Uh, we were plunked down there, and uh, that was what? Well, that was the training there. And uh, I, I can remember uh, the, um, our band, Division Band. We had, a, we had a darn good band, good jazz band. And uh, so they played a concert. If anybody wants to go to the concert, he went across the bridge into this uh, churchyard. It was an uh, enclosed uh, stone wall thing. And they played, and it was very nice just about a day or two, I think, before the 16th of December. And uh, so, uh, and that's when, when things started, December 16th, they broke through. We were getting, incidentally, it was, everybody talks about the surprise. To our infantry, it was no surprise. You know, they had been coming back, reports, patrols, of all this stuff that was going on, all old German armor, vehicles, and so forth coming up. So they knew that they were there, and everything I read now is this throwing straw around and so forth, and the, uh, the Germans to, to quiet the, the noise of the vehicles. <laughs> Guys, they didn't say it was, was not noisy. This was an awful lot of noise. They said, Jesus, they're, they're getting ready to do something. But nothing was happening. Uh, they never sent up any, anything to indicate that they knew there was a, a big attack coming. That's the thing. So Vince, as you, as you described, the 28th was moved mm -hmm. out of the Hurtgen Forest area, yeah. moved further south down along the line for arrest and recuperation. Mm -hmm. And that's where some of these activities that you described yeah. uh, took place. Right. On December 16th, <coughs> for our audience, I think it's mm -hmm. fair to let them know that on December 16th, mm -hmm. the Germans sprung the Super what's now nice. known as the Battle of the Bulge. Right. It was a surprise offensive to at least a hierarchy within the Allied yeah. Command, but as you're noting, yeah. At your level, well, apparently you knew something was up sure, and something sure. was about to unfold. Sure. Vince, on December 16th, what happened? 16th. Well, we had been alerted to, to double our guards. So somebody at least was acknowledging that something was going to happen. And uh, it must have been 5, 5.30 so in the morning. And all of a sudden, everything opened up. Uh, and the German, oh, it got bright all of a sudden. It was a murky, foggy, drizzly day. And uh, it was, all of a sudden, this, it, be, it became bright. Uh, they had turned on lights, their tanks. They pulled them up into the woods and on, alongside the road. And they shone these lights on the clouds. And it, it, it was a very eerie sight. And let's say it began to be very noisy. And the Germans opened up, I remember, uh, uh, alongside us, along the, the hills. They beat hell out of the hills there with these uh, screaming memes, German Nebelwerfer. It's a, it's a ro rocket uh, mortar. And it, you could hear the, the, they'd spin the barrels that they actually spun around, I think, until eight eight rockets or something like that, or six, I don't know what it was. But at any rate, uh, 
made an awful screaming noise. That's where we nicknamed them screaming memes. We didn't, everybody did. And, uh, but uh, they beat hell out of the hill next to us and they weren't hitting anything because they could have done a lot more damage than they did, but uh, they were a little bit off on their coordinates. During the course of the attack mm. on the 16th, mm. how close to your position did the Germans come? And how did you react? Well, I can remember the the uh, the 40s, 40 millimeters that had had dug in to fire. They were pulled out because they had to get ready to move back and to get across that bridge. Because if we didn't get across that bridge, then there was no place for us to go until the Germans took us. And uh, so uh, we had orders to hold, and uh, let's see. I got to think about this, and, but uh, they were coming down. I can, looking off in this direction, up I should say north. There was uh, a, a ridge line, and up over the ridge line, all these these tanks started to come. All tanks of all kinds, and armored vehicles of all kinds, equipment of all kinds, and uh, they were coming down this road on the other side of the river, just in a little bit, which got nicknamed uh, Skyline Drive, and we could see that these tanks silhouetted against things, and everybody was firing at them, you know including us. And the 40 millimeter is, isn't a big weapon, you know? but a light armor thing with the armor piercing or firing, a lot of armor piercing stuff would, would pierce that, you know. And they hit a couple of them. But at any rate, we knew that it was just a question of time before they'd come down and get us. What we didn't know was up along the Skyline Drive, the roads were going that way back toward the rear and our division headquarters and battalion headquarters, too, incidentally, was at the Wilts <coughs> in Luxembourg. And uh, so that's where they were going there. And then they go down further, then they hit Bastogne. And that's where they were going. That would be bringing them inland and then their objective to get to Antwerp eventually. But we didn't know all that at the time. We just had to hold. And, uh, but, uh, uh, I know uh, up above us was the 106th Division, and you know about them. They were brand new. They had just just come from the States, I think, about a couple weeks before then. So they had no actual experience at all, their officers and so forth. No, nobody knew anything in, in, them. in fairness to them. They gained an awful lot of criticism because they had two whole battalions surrendered, and uh, the third one got out. Uh, 24th or something like that was the number of it. We met them again at St. Vith. But at any rate, uh, they, uh, there was also an, another new division. I think it was the 90th or 99th. 99th. 99th, yeah. And uh, they were taking off a licking. Because I can remember saying to one fellow, Jesus, they're, they're, they're taking a hell of a pounding up there, you know. It was a cavalry outfit, too. A cavalry outfit, I, I was Essex a Troop Cavalry of Newark and the Oranges. It was the 14th Fra Armored Cavalry Group. Was that what it was? Right. right. They were a spit and polish outfit. They're good. They're nice show. They used to put on shows, you know, peacetime. They had the horses. They became mechanized later at Fort Riley in Kansas. But at any rate, uh, a friend of mine, my best friend, matter of fact, Joe Podesky, his brother Leonard was, was an officer with them. And uh, we talked about it after the war sometime. We, and. Uh, mentioned places that we all were both familiar with, you know, he knew, I knew. And uh, they took an awful, awful shellacking there. And Can you recall and, some details about that fighting? A lot of, a lot of uh, tank fire. I forget which alpha, maybe was, uh, which armored division, third armored, I think, I'm not sure. Or and seventh armored. It was a seventh. Seventh. That was seventh. And, uh, but, uh, they were maneuvering all the time through the woods, back out of the woods, up here and there. And uh, the story was that they, they would have to keep a road open so he could get out, otherwise you'd be, you were constantly being surrounded, 
not us, but everybody. And uh, so uh, we we pulled out of there maybe the next day, and uh, and we didn't know it because I say you don't know anything really uh, the way you're heading. Maybe the non-coms knew, and they didn't know much either. The officers knew, but then. Uh, uh, we were, we were split up. The division was split up. Regiments were going all different ways. We, uh, oh, I have to mention Clairvaux. Clairvaux was our rest area, so-called rest area. Rest area from the rest. <laughs> any rate, uh, there was a castle there. It was a big battle there. Our, our um, uh, 110th Regiment uh, was very heavily involved. A lot of tank fire. And that area, you know, is a very bad tank country because the roads were, would go down and up, and, and they were narrow. And the, the Germans were at a disadvantage because they, they couldn't turn those damn tanks. They're big, and uh, they would get caught at a, a, a junction or a turn, and they'd take an awful lot of firing because uh, they couldn't move. And then they'd hold up a whole column, and then the, the artillery would have a, have a ball. And the Air Force wasn't out in force yet. They didn't come out till what was it, Christmas time or somewhere around the Christmas time. Vince, if war ever broke out again, mm. with what you know now about what war is all about, mm. would you volunteer to serve this country again? If I had to, I'd say yes. Uh, maybe, maybe I wouldn't be as gung ho about it. But uh, another drawback now would uh, uh, would be because of the family relationships and so forth. I couldn't, of course, physically I couldn't. <laughs> oh, jeez. But uh, uh, I think uh, I think the, uh, the young guys <coughs> and gals come in for a lot of criticism. Uh, especially after the Vietnam situation, which was which was a terrible thing, and uh, those fellows, uh, I feel sorry for them. What they had to put up with, you know, they should never, never have to put up with in this country, especially uh, the way the people did not receive them, because uh, we were received as real heroes. Which that word always shakes me. I feel just embarrassed. You know, everybody talks about heroes and heroes. Uh, but uh, maybe you did a lot of things that uh, they could commend you for, but you weren't doing any more than the next guy was doing, or than you had to do. You know, you were you were following orders, doing what you were supposed to do. You had to do because it had to be done, and uh, that's the way we looked at it. And uh, but I'm sure that uh, if we get involved heavily again, <coughs> which may happen. I think uh, young people will come through. I think they'll do what we did, you know. And uh, maybe they'll, they'll earn that to hero designation, you know. But there's no question about it, I think they'll do it. That's, that's our way of life.